Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you uh, to this uh, workshop this evening with Augusta Rose on preserving legacy. Uh, we're having a lot of fun doing virtual programming while we wait out uh, being able to do in person. Um, so we're thankful that Augusta has this great project for all of us. Um, these adult programs that we uh, keep going, you know, are supported by the Central Berkshire Fund of the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation and Fairfield County's Community Foundation. Um, we always welcome your feedback on programming. We are still working on the rest of the year. We tend to only be uh, at most two months ahead on planning. So if you have something you'd really like us uh, to present, email or give us a call or put a note in the chat screen, okay? We will periodically throughout the presentation add links in the chat screen and the video of the presentation tonight will be available, uh, a link on our website. Um, so you'll be able to have that as well to go back for reminders or to sh you know share with others who weren't able to be here tonight. If you're not on video tonight, and most of us won't be, to help our accuracy for programming records, if you would answer the poll question that's gonna come out. Um, that the librarian's gonna send off for all of us to see on how many people in your household are watching this presentation right now. Because for some people it might just be one, but others have a couple. Um, when you are um, watching Augusta, you might wanna choose a speaker view while she's talking so that you're not necessarily seeing all of us. Um, if your video is on, um, just keep in mind that your video is on um, so that uh, if you have to interact with family or talk or anything like that, um, you could always turn your video off. Uh, we, if you're calling in on your phone, just remember to keep your handset muted. Otherwise, phone calls and stuff could end up ringing in the middle. Um, and that's about it for this evening. Uh, we look forward to your feedback. Oh, you will also receive a post-event survey that'll come via email. And if you have a few minutes uh, just to fill it out, it's a few simple questions for feedback so that when we give our reports to the foundations that fund us, um, you know, we can tell them what people are asking for additional work programming. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to turn this over to Augusta, and uh, we'll be enjoying her presentation and her work. Thank you, Augusta, for joining us. Thank you, Jody. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. I'm very happy to be uh, doing this and sharing this work and happy that you're here. Um, and thank you to the Beckett Athenaeum, of course, for hosting. Um, I think it's a really important and uh, special thing to keep uh, you know, programs going, especially now. So um, yeah, so I uh, have been a documentary photographer since about 2004. Um, I fell in love with uh, the medium because it involved connecting with people in a meaningful way. Um, and being able to visually communicate their essence, I just sort of fell into that passion. Um, I grew up on Cape Cod and I have a um, very strong sense of, um, well, my roots are there, my family, my ancestors go way back. Uh, so that's part of what inspired this whole offering is being uh, quite familiar with my own family history uh, which I will get into right now. Let's see. Okay. Do you have to turn the TV on? Mom, turn, turn your. Oh. So um, 
this all kind of began uh, for me when I was visiting uh, Nepal in 2013. I was producing a, um, a documentary video, a, a promotional video for a nonprofit there that's um, building schools in remote villages in the mountains. And while I was there, um, I met an elder um, woman who was sitting on the side of the road and sort of gestured um, for me to come sit next to her. And we started communicating, not verbally because we didn't speak the same language at all, but um, this universal language of uh, joy uh, and uh, you know, laughing and smiling and um, you know, playfulness kind of, she can see she's wearing my sunglasses and um, I put my hat on her and it was very, very sweet, tender moment. And um, I, I observed that I started observing the culture um, from through that lens of uh, how do people treat elders here and um, noticing that they're really a, a big part of the culture uh, in that they were respected and valued and listened to by uh, everybody in the village and these villages are so small and remote it was about two day drive um, from Kathmandu that everybody in the village sort of takes care of each other the the children take care of the grandparents the grandparents take care of the children and the grandchildren etc so I kind of um, brought these uh, observations back to America and uh, contrasted to sort of the, the um, system that we have here set up for our, our elders. And I was um, moved to uh, create an offering that gave um, older folks a way to uh, be seen and valued after retirement age because I noticed that a lot of folks were uh, kind of lost a sense of purpose. Um, so in Nepal, this, these are some of the children. Um, they're being given school supplies and you can tell they're just delighted. Uh, and this is one of, you know, the elders from the village sort of um, lovingly, uh, you know, taking that in. And this was, you know, just an example of how um, everybody, you know, participated in the, the village and everybody was part of everybody's life and, and there was no kind of isolation. And I really, I really loved that. Um, <clears throat> so that brings me to my own grandmother. I had a good relationship with her, but I hadn't really excavated her past um, to the extent that I started after uh, I came back from Nepal. It, I was inspired to start, you know, exploring my own lineage and um, start asking her questions about her childhood. Um, she uh, was an animal lover, as you can see, uh, very much so. And, um, and she loved the, uh, the hard scrabble life, she called it sort of living simply and um, uh, she was an antique dealer, so she loved, you know, the old ways of life, and that was just sort of part of my upbringing. It was always in the background, but I didn't have the um, the maturity to really appreciate how rare it is to have access to um, family resources the way that um, that I did through her and my my father, which um, I'll get into later. So this is her, um, uh, you know, in a candid moment, I was, I was um, recording a conversation with her and um, she said, you know, I like talking about my youth and I can remember it like it was yesterday, but what I did yesterday, I can't tell you. And that sort of captures her personality and, um, you know, she's very uh, fun and, um, and uh, introspective at the same time, but she really, she was a, a very resilient um, woman. And um, this is a photo of her around age 17 that 
her husband carried around his wallet until he passed away at age 85. Um, and when she was showing me this, she, she laughed and she said, isn't that funny? He must have loved me. Um, so she was just such a doll in many, many ways, um, very stubborn as well. But I, uh, spending time with her helped me kind of see values in myself that, um, that I wanted to sort of uh, emphasize in, in my life and kind of live those values on. Uh, this brings me to my dad, John. Um, my dad is a local historian and um, he also has this, shares this uh, passion for local history and uh, our, our lineage and uh, many other hobbies. Uh, one of them being guitar. He started playing guitar when he was 10, I believe. Um, and I felt um, a sense of urgency to start um, documenting his, his legacy um, because he has Parkinson's. And so the things that he has loved doing his whole life are now, um, you know, uh, becoming more and more compromised. And so I, I felt the sense of urgency of, you know, I want to uh, capture his legacy now while he is still able to, um, you know, uh, play the guitar and um, work outside doing manual labor. This is him uh, pointing out an, a very old map. Um, he has a whole library of, of, um, of photos and journal entries from ancestors and newspaper clippings and lots of uh, great stuff like that. And this is um, a little electronic device, a little blinker. It blinks, it flashes uh, light. And um, he made it when he was a kid. I don't remember exactly the age, but he was young. Um, and he still has the, the design that he made for it um, and was inspired by his grandfather who gave him popular electronics um, magazine to, uh, to start kind of exploring because he, he saw him doing it. And um, that's sort of another example of, uh, observing, you know, see, seeing family members be really passionate about something and um, kind of sparking that same passion in, in oneself. So that's, uh, that's at least my personal experience with it. This is my favorite photo <laughs> or one of them, um, young John in a tree. Um, environmental preservation is another one of his uh, passions and, and a big piece of his career. And I've also inherited that love for, for nature and, um, and protecting the earth. So this is, you know, why preserving legacy is so important uh, and crucial to me personally is these um, family attributes are so precious. And um, to me, at least it, it doesn't, it hasn't felt like enough to just hear the stories um, and, and, you know, spend the quality time and, uh, and, you know, think, think about how life used to be. There's got, I, I've needed to incorporate a, um, a, a, a tangible, um, uh, you know, piece of that. And so I've been doing that through photography and interviewing, um, uh, our elders and, um, yeah, making some work with that. So. I think this is maybe the final photo. This is um, an antique, it's very hot in here. Um, this is an antique cranberry scoop that belonged to my great, great grandmother. And antiques were a, a big part of, uh, um, it, are a big part of my family's legacy. And my dad has many of them uh, all around the house. So this is just um, a little, some, wisdom um, and my dad. And um, I could not agree with the statement more and I try to embody it myself um, whenever I can. So the first takeaway from, um, uh, you know, reflecting on 
this is a personal journey. I have learned to sort of identify family themes and stories, um, you know, paying attention to what stories are told over and over again, and really uh, actively listening and um, not uh, waiting to speak, but just sort of, uh, you know, asking, kind of guiding the, the conversation down paths that the, the, the subject, um, whoever you're talking to, uh, feels comfortable talking talking about. And um, I found that that's been uh, the most effective way to sort of um, evoke the, the best quotes and, um, and little gems. So this brings me to um, a photo of myself in 2017 and my great great grandmother, my grandmother's grandmother, uh, Rosa, in, I always have to check the date because I'm bad with dates, 1878. She was 14 years old in this photo. And uh, that's the same age that I got my first serious uh, DSLR camera and started um, my uno unofficially started my career as a photographer. And when I juxtapose my life and the opportunities that I have and um, privilege with hers, it's, uh, it's quite humbling. Um, and it helps me personally foster a deeper appreciation for um, amenities and, you know, uh, as a, as a woman opportunities to, you know, in career wise and, and otherwise. So this is one example of a, a something tangible that really um, intrigued me. Uh, when I first saw this photo, my jaw dropped and I got really confused um, because of the, the physical you know, similarities, but then it, it kind of pulled me in and, and got me thinking about her as an individual and um, what her life was like. And I, I asked, started asking my dad and my grandmother about her and um, yeah, it's quite humbling is, is um, how I would summarize that. So this is a prompt I was thinking um, we could go over um, in the end and, and share if any of you are um, feel compelled to answer, or, you know, have an immediate answer or want to think about it for a while. This is something that I like to ask myself sometimes and ask other people. Um, if you could sit down with any one of your ancestors over tea, who would you meet, why, and what would you ask them? So um, if you have an answer or you wanna think about it at the end, maybe we could all kind of um, share what comes to us because uh, I would love to, to hear, I'm very curious, but if people have immediate answers or if they have to think about it or if they don't know their ancestors, I've gotten a lot of different answers over the years. So Walter and Danny, um, Walter is uh, Danny's great, was Danny's great grandfather. My friend, Catherine, um, asked me to photograph their, um, this very, very special bond that they had. It's my first Preserving Legacy shoot. And she, she recognized their, uh, their connection and, you know, specifically wanted it photographed. Um, Walter was 99 in uh, these photos. He was not um, mobile. He couldn't really hear or um, speak very well, but his face would um, light up every time, just like this, um, every time Danny would um, come down uh, every morning. And Catherine was, uh, you know, noticed that or inferred that this was his reason for waking up every day and said that um, you know his grandkids like kept him alive um, and she was very grateful to have these photos to share uh, he passed away about two weeks after the shoot um, coincidentally the same day that I was uh, submitting them along with an application to a uh, a grant to do preserving legacy work. So uh, I was um, 
divine timing and I took that as a sign to keep going with this project. I was very moved by, by this connection with this little tiny baby and, um, and, uh, and Walter. Um, and one of the things that I found while working with them is uh, sometimes you have to be creative about how you, um, if you can't interview them directly, uh, you know, what are workarounds and how can we cater to the, the comfort level and the, the capability of the subject. Uh, so I ended up interviewing Catherine about Walter um, because he wasn't able to, to answer questions. And we sort of, um, you know, did the shoot just very casually when he was in bed, low pressure kind of um, situation. So the capturing candid moments uh, as opposed to formal like staged, you know, setups, I've found are the, the way to go because if the subjects are already in their natural environment and they are um, feeling safe and they're just sort of doing their thing and it's, you know, you're coming in as more of a, of a witness um, to what, you know, whatever their happy place is, that's when I find we capture the, the most authentic and beautiful moments. This is mother and daughter, um, Janet and Amy, and they're um, lovely people, uh, very close. They wanted to focus their shoot on the, um, the three generations, Amy, her mother, Janet, and her mother. And Amy took these photos uh, when she was in college, these black and white photos of the three of them. And they were sitting in a box, um, you know, in storage somewhere. And Amy had this idea to sort of breathe a second life into them by incorporating them into their um, preserving legacy session. So we sort of centered uh, a section of the, the session around these photos and, um, this is this fair family heirloom, this ring was passed down through the three generations. And so they had a, a sort of, you know, specific goal in mind. Um, and so it, it's sort of in that, at, at that point, there's a, like a, a structure for the shoot, but also improvising and um, again, trying to avoid staged, although some of those photos are clearly staged when they're holding them up, but, um, Amy, it was very important that Amy uh, capture these, these images to share with her son. Um, and so that was, uh, that was kind of her primary uh, uh, objective with this, with this shoot and for her whole family to enjoy and of course for Janet to enjoy. So this creative improvisation, um, you know, what, what do we have around us that we want to incorporate into the shoot? How can we use, um, you know, items or pets or, you know, whatever is around uh, collections to, you know, illustrate this, this person's legacy uh, and include heirlooms and have a, you know, a, a set of questions about the heirlooms themselves because it's, um, that information can so easily be lost if it's not written down or um, you know shared orally through um, you know through the generations um, a sort of oral description where did it come from who had it it um, I personally find that very important because if that information is lost then uh, it, it's a, it's like half of the heirloom itself at least um, to me my family so here's Veer and Misa. Um, Veer was a philosophy professor and Misa is a brilliant artist and was very important to them that uh, the, their family traditions and rituals were, were documented. 
one of the main ones, the things they loved to do together was drink wine and reminisce about the travels that they used to have when they were younger all around the world, eat food from, you know, uh, different places, read books, uh, look at art together. They had all these little family traditions and that was, you know, how they spent um, quality time together. So Nisa shared um, after this shoot that on the way home uh, from it, she, she, she told me that she wished, she, she wished he was ready to pass away because it felt like uh, this beautiful closure. Um, like it, they, it was a perfect afternoon and he was so happy. And the reason she uh, shared this with me which was recently is because his last year was um, pretty unpleasant. He ended up falling and had to go to hospital. And then the um, assisted living home uh, folks uh, sent him to a nursing home and uh, took away his wine or you know, gave it to him in a little plastic cup. He stopped drinking wine. Um, which is, you know, unfortunately sort of a, a very, I hear a lot of very sad stories like that. Um, and it's, it's a difficult problem to solve because there are so many people and not every family is able to accommodate um, for their aging loved ones. But, uh, you know, Misa's message to me uh, was to take advantage of the time where everybody is you know, relatively healthy and happy and in their, you know, a, a comfortable space, as opposed to waiting um, until, you know, it's, uh, things get difficult to be, to be frank. Uh, so this is just a very sweet candid and sort of just, you know, um, th this is their relationship. This, this was their relationship and it still is their relationship because Misa reflects on these photos often and shares them on social media. I see her posting them and um, it was, uh, she, was, she was very grateful that this, this time happened the way it did, that it unfolded the way it did. And I was quite honored to be able to, to capture their very, very sweet connection. So quality time, um, I learned a lot from working with them because I uh, just got to see all these cute little traditions that they had and really adding value to Veer's life um, in when he was in a situation where he, he, he had lost his wife and he was living in an apartment and you know somewhat isolated. So uh, Misa was really focused on how can I you know, bring little comfort and joy to him. And, uh, you know, being prepared to document everything as it's, as it's happening, when you can feel that uh, this is a really special moment or they're really happy or, you know, this grandkid is here or this pet and you see their face light up. And uh, those are the moments to really, it's, you know, don't hesitate to, um, to document them, whether or not, you know, you, have a professional camera, you really know what you're doing. It's, it, I think it's better to have something in those moments if, um, if you can. So a few more questions to consider um, about your family. What are your family values and what do you love doing the most together? Do you have little traditions? Are they centered around holidays or um, you know, graduation or birthdays, et cetera? Um, and, you know, being uh, prepared at those events or gatherings to, um, to capture those, those candid sweet moments. So, Nisa, um, Nina, sorry, Nina uh, is a, a wonderful woman that I was fortunate enough to work with as, as a personal care attendant for about seven months, um, she passed away from Parkinson's. She was an intellectual and um, very generously uh, 
uh, let me ask her all kinds of questions about her life and philosophy and um, her family. And uh, she was a really, really wonderful person to be around. Um, and I felt like I had to, uh, you know, capture her essence as best I could. This photo I gave to the family um, when we were celebrating her life after she passed and her husband put it on the mantle and looks at it every day um, he shared with me and that really uh, warms my heart very much um, so you know i i was able to take these uh, different kinds of photos throughout my time working with her uh, you know when she was resting and you know doing these little things reading. She was an amazing artist. This is one of her pieces. And I, I personally found a sense of um, security and gratification of uh, being able to sort of, um, you know, capture these, these pieces of her legacy and these moments with her family. This is her holding her uh, daughter's hand. And this sort of propelled me even further and kind of recognizing that this sort of work um, could be valuable for, for families and could potentially help them um, heal and give them sort of a sense of, um, you know, peace of mind that these, these stories and experiences and wisdom uh, won't, you know, leave with the person. They'll still live on in other formats that can be, um, easily shared. So another prompt, um, what family stories would you like to preserve and pass on to uh, future generations? And this is something that I don't think many of us think of unless there is a, sort of a catalyst for that or um, until it's, it's too late. Unfortunately, I've um, spoken to a lot of people who said, you know, I wish I asked my mom more questions. I wish I took more pictures of my dad or, um, you know, things along that, those uh, lines. And this is part of my, um, my purpose with this, with this work is to really encourage people to start asking those questions, even if it's just of themselves. Um, so this, This, uh, I, I created an exhibition to uh, share. I shared a couple different places with the intention to, um, you know, expose other people to these, these stories and really plant the seed of, um, you know, for, for asking those questions themselves. So this was the, the opening of my first exhibition, which was in June of 2019 on Cape Cod, obviously clearly um, before the pandemic. This is my radiant grandmother. Um, she thought it was just so hilarious that her pictures were all over the wall. Um, and uh, folks were, were uh, intrigued. And I, I heard a lot of stories, um, you know, about their own, family members and that was exactly my my hope was that uh it, they wouldn't just absorb you know as art pieces but they would start it would start you know generating the that um you know the thoughts of, about their own um family and their own legacy and what does it mean to preserve my legacy so i started creating uh these photo essay books as a means of uh delivering these uh, interview, um, set, you know, segments and the photos that I, I took at these, um, at these family gatherings. And you can see this is, um, this is a very proud couple with their book. Um, and yeah, it, it, it really, uh, it really makes me very happy to be able to gift this to uh, people who know that they want to 
preserve but don't have the the tools or the time so to come in as an outside party and be able to just ask them questions and um and you know see how they how they respond and see how much they love sharing their wisdom this is another uh family that um they brought me out to uh, Washington on Father's Day because that was one of the few times their whole family was getting together and it was a very large family so we had to do it in sections and it was all you know uh, centered around you know their quality time and how how they spent their quality time as a family. These are a few excerpts from the uh, photo essay book. This is about um, uh, family heirloom, hand painted dishes. Um, this woman, Patty, her mother did. Uh, she had a, a stroke uh, so young and lived till 96. Very artistic, but after the stroke, she had no feeling on her right side. She never complained. She was a good, good woman. So being able to, um, you know, pair these, uh, these heirlooms with the story and if the photos are available the, the photos of the um, family members is a really uh, neat thing to do and these are um, just the uh, patty commenting on uh, her her family and uh, you know talking about her husband um, Bless his heart, had nothing to do with raising the girls. He did change a diaper if I didn't happen to be home, but that's pretty much it. So this really, um, really cute sort of um, bubbly energy that she she brought to uh, the, the whole family. And so I tried to kind of, um, you know, work with that energy and bring it into the, into the book. Uh, so this is a, uh, part of my the package that I designed. It's a series of black and white, my, my um, selects, my favorite photos. And I sort of experimented and I, um, uh, with these, you know, uh, different formats to deliver the, the photos to the family members and uh, kind of packaged it all together. So this is my, um, my offering that I sort of incorporated into my, my business um, that really stemmed from this, this calling of, uh, you know, my own familial history and being inspired by this, this country on the other side of the world. Um, oh yeah, that's what I have. Um, <clears throat> Before we uh, continue, I would like to um, thank a, a bunch of people. Wow, I'm really sweating. It's very hot in here. Um, <laughs> my family, uh, obviously my mom, uh, my dad, my sister being very patiently um, helping me sort of uh, troubleshoot and design this offering. Um, my friend Ryan, who I believe is here, uh, she helped me design the photo essay books. And my friends Megan and Matthew, um, they helped me transcribe the interviews. Um, Blue, Katie, Rob, and Johnny uh, all have helped me um, throw around ideas and kind of, um, you know, distill the whole process down. Uh, and Johnny really helped me significantly in pulling this presentation together and um, making, helping me realize that I needed to start with my own family um, uh, and really focus on documenting their legacy. Um, and so it's coming from, from a really heartfelt place when I offer it to others, so. And there are other people I'm, <laughs> um, that I did not mention, but um, those are the main ones that stuck by me throughout this process and very grateful for them. So I will turn it back over to Jody um, and we can um, maybe have a little discussion about the questions. If any of you feel like participating, um, we can revisit them, I can reread them. 
Hi, Augusta. There are quite a few questions in the chat, actually. Um, so that's exciting. Um, we had one participant when you asked uh, them to think of a question they'd like to have been able to ask a relative. Um, and Barbara said, um, let me see. Where did I just have it? Oop. She never knew her maternal grandfather and wonder what his life was like, you know? So that, that plays into why do we do these, you know, um, pulling together these interviews really of our family members. Um, one of the questions is what is the hardest part of your work in preserving legacy? That's a good question. Um, the first thing that comes to me is uh, fear of loss. Um, I, when I connect with people, I, I usually connect with them pretty strongly. Um, and, you know, whether they're, they're friends or, um, or partners or, or clients. And so I, I kind of invest a little piece of my heart um, into these, these shoots. And I think the hardest part is knowing that when I'm working with um, uh, an aging loved one that, you know, probably sooner rather than later, they, um, it's likely that they will pass on. And, you know, as I mentioned, many of my um, clients in these photos have. And so I think the hardest part is just um, knowing that that's coming. Uh, and, you know, it, it, does, it does help me, uh, it does help with the process in terms of um, the process itself is a reminder that we have so many opportunities that we don't think of or that we don't um, we don't act on because it doesn't occur to us to um, you know document um, people when they are still sharp or you know healthy. So when I'm working with someone and I'm aware that, you know, they will pass on at some point, it's, it sort of sharpens my focus and it reminds me that, um, you know, th I'm taking action steps and that gives me, me a, a peace of mind. And um, I kind of use that to, to help uh, curb that, that fear of loss and that, that like preemptive sadness, I guess. So. so in truth, that would play into what we're all, hopefully gonna take away from this workshop and as we go to our own loved ones, or it could be a neighbor. I mean, I have older neighbors that I kind of wonder, is anyone getting their story in truth? Mm -hmm. And you and I had talked weeks ago when we were first brainstorming this about how we tend to think of just gathering stories from our elders, but the truth is there's a lot to be said for gathering them from our youth as well, from the young ones. Another question someone has asked is how do you suggest doing this kind of beautiful legacy work with the elders in one's own family? Like what kind of, um, uh, not tricks, but like what kind of, uh, <laughs> sorry, really not tricks, um, techniques do you find got people to open the best? You used a lot of photographs, so I would imagine that's a good segue into a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sort of letting them lead with what they like to talk about. So my grandmother, for example, she she loved photographs. She collected them, um, and we would, you know, take out these big boxes of photos and just go through them. And I would ask her about each one, and that started the you know the whole uh, ball rolling in terms of you you know start to go down one path and then there's just all of these other paths open up because they're they're speaking from a really authentic place and they're they're being seen um and so i highly recommend you know focusing on what makes them happy what they've done most of their life um is it you know bowling or um you know collecting 
uh, baseball cards or, you know, going for walks in a certain area or, you know, whatever it is, um, join them in doing that and sort of uh, kind of see where, where they lead you by, by starting there. That's what I recommend. Okay. The next question is, um, how would you suggest uh, applying these techniques to written legacies as opposed to the visual? Um, like if we're taking oral histories or having uh, giving people prompts maybe to do their own writing for us or we or us taking down um, their words. Yeah, I, I highly recommend recording conversations always. And there is software to transcribe. There are you know, um, companies that can transcribe or you can do it on your own. I find that really, um, really um, fun and interesting to just listen to these random voice memos that I have. Um, they're somewhat organized uh, of my grandmother. And my uh, dad actually did the same thing. He used to um, interview or, or just ask questions of the um, some of the the older folks in in his town and just ask them about you know do you remember the first car it, like first telephone you know and my, like my grandmother told me that her it was her grandmother had um, her phone number was five <laughs> she's the fifth phone in the town and you know that's that's something that uh, I just found really. Um, really uh, fascinating and it's so much more enriching to have the audio as well as the the written so my approach is to record the, the conversation and to have an idea of you know um prompts or questions and then take sort of shorthand notes about you know the things that's that stand out as they're talking um and then the shorthand notes can you you can like you know listen and sort of um elaborate on the you know the the parts that really stand out to you and the the themes that you see um you can kind of pull themes out of different stories and pay attention to what people repeat and what they love talking about so i hope that answered the the question <laughs> I'm, I'm sure little. there's more i'm just scrolling through asking them as i come to them Great. um now we have one, how long do you spend with families in order to capture the intimacy you've clearly been able to capture from these otherwise strangers? Yeah, that's a great question. It's yeah. each uh, shoot is, is custom tailored. So uh, for Walters, for example, you know, he, he had a, a um, didn't have a whole lot of stamina to, to you know, um, be awake and alert uh, because of you know where he was at, and so that photo shoot was it was just one specific you know the the baby and and the grandfather you know I'm 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 set up and ready and the baby comes in and you know they have a little exchange uh, and so that shoot was you know 20 minutes or so maybe mm -hmm. um, the Fosse shoot the the family um, over in in um, Washington outside of Seattle. Uh, they planned a whole family gathering and, and, you know, flew me out for that gathering. Um, so because their family is, is located kind of all over the place. And so, you know, a couple times a year, they're able to all get together. So that shoot was more extensive because it involved um, going out on the golf course with uh, Lee, you know, the, the father, um, and kind of riding around and taking photos of him and his elements and then coming back and, you know, chatting with um, Patty, his wife, and, you know, there's, you know, their kids and then uh, their kids there, and then they left and then another group came in because, you know, the family's so large. So that was a whole day long project. Right. Um, so it really, it depends on the, you know, each family and what their, you know, the specifics of their dynamic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have, uh one participant who said, I've put together photo books for our grandchildren ages three and a half and six months of their dad um, from birth to present day. It includes grandparents, great grandparents, aunts and uncles, and it was enjoyable to do. Also have a grandmother book I did for them. And she mentioned she loved the idea of photographing heirlooms, including them in an album. That is a really good idea. I had never thought of that. 
Um, yeah, you know. it's I again with that that security of um, you know if if the actual the God forbid the actual object gets lost, there's at least another form of documentation, and you know that can be shared. The the mm -hmm. heirloom itself, it, you know, there's only one of a kind, but if it's you know in a photographic form, uh, it can be shared with all kinds of family members, and that's a really special thing. I know in, in my family, my grandmother was an artist, a painter, and um, some of her paintings were on plaster walls in my grandparents' house. <laughs> and then everyone passes away and the house is sold and you can't keep plaster. Um, so I grabbed the best camera we had available and started taking photographs. And, and we all have taken photographs of what artwork we have and shared it to all the cousins, aunts and uncles. So even though each person doesn't have that piece of artwork, right. they have a photograph of it and they can work from there. And someone told me recently getting them printed as gicle um, prints mm -hmm. is very good quality. And you can, so for anyone who has artists in the family, um, there's that as a possibility, I know. Um, trying to see. So your length of time with clients varies. It can be a couple of hours or it could potentially be days or it could be a couple of hours here and there depending on events, right? Right. Like with my dad, it's going to be an ongoing thing because um, there's so much to his history and he has a whole you know, mm -hmm. library devoted to um, our, you know, our ancestors and mm -hmm. There are a lot of components, and of course, I'm you know I'm biased because I'm his daughter. Um, I'm you know very personally invested, but because he has so much to share, uh, we've you know decided to do it in sort of shorter increments. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, if there's a more sort of specific, you know, um, intention, a family is I, I this is you know they they already have it planned out in their mind. This is you know my grandfather like you know collected these things and this is his prize you know possession or whatever you know then it's a, it doesn't need to be a whole you know drawn out thing so it really just depends I'm I stay really open and flexible to you know um, meeting them wherever they're at and whatever their needs are okay and then once you spend the time with them and you do the photo shoot and all that what is the length of time till the project is finished? Like what you've made your, um, like the final books that you were doing? It's, that one's tricky to say because um, I, uh, those books were sort of a, I, I was um, figuring it out as I went along. So it took a lot longer than, um, you know, it, it does now because I have a streamlined system. Um, and, you know, working with several people, having someone transcribe and then, you know, editing and then pairing the photos. So there's, there are a lot of steps to the process. Um, so it's, it, it also depends again on how long the, you know, the shoot is, if it's a whole day, it's going to be longer. The book's going to be longer. If it's two hours, you know, it's, it's not going to be as much work. Mm -hmm. If um, one of the subjects is a talker, you know, it's going to be a little longer to um, sift through, you know, what they have to say. If somebody is, you know, uh, has, you know, few, a few words, someone a few words, then it's less time. So it's really, it's really hard to determine um, the length of time, but. Right. Yeah. But you probably have a range of within a couple of weeks or within, has it, what is the longest project you've ever had? <laughs> Um, other than your family, I mean, other than your own family. Yeah, um, it's taken it's taken up to a year um, before, and that was because uh, again this trial and error, and they they were the family was uh, aware, you know, made aware of that that because it was an experimental um, for me, and I was creating a product from scratch, mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that is probably the the longest it's, it, it's taken. Uh, again, if, you know, if I were to do that same project now, um, having it be, you know, streamlined, it would be, you know, three months maximum, probably, um, or less, depending on who's on my team. Um, I was doing a lot of that work. Uh, it was just Ryan and I um, putting it together. So because there are only two of us and, you know, I had other jobs going at the same time, it took a lot longer. But at this point, it's, 
it's a, you know, it's, it's getting to the point where it's a pretty well-oiled machine and there I have, you know, other folks to help me. So yeah, it takes a lot less time now. Um, have you had instances where families are trying to help, you know, get more information from relatives and some relatives are uh, hesitant to talk? They're, you know, not everyone enjoys revisiting uh, different periods of time. Do you have um, certain prompts that seem to help people more? That's a good question. So what I do is I actually send the families a list of um, potential questions ahead of time. And so they can preview them and, uh, you know, choose um, what questions resonate with them the most. And I have run into that where, you know, usually it's the, 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 the um, client is the, the kid of the subject. And they'll say, my, my, dad, you know, uh, had a rough childhood. Can you avoid questions about that? Um, it would probably take them to, you know, an unpleasant place. And so we kind of like work around um, that. So there's, there's a, you know, a, a system in place to make sure that they're not being put on the spot or feeling uncomfortable. Uh, and some family members, you know, are made aware that, that it's happening, but they choose not to participate. And, you know, that's right. everyone's prerogative. So Right. Yeah, I hope that answers. We have a couple of uh, questions uh, about your availability uh, for being hired. One is how does someone go about it, which I know we'll be sharing or have already shared your website. Mm -hmm. um, but also it must be difficult to continue your work during this pandemic. Are you still available for hire during the pandemic? And what does preserving legacy look like in the age of COVID? Hmm. Yeah. Great questions. Um, yes, I'm, I am definitely available and um, uh, much more so now that, uh, you know, we're all being vaccinated, um, well, most of us, and uh, it's warm. And so I, a lot of my shoots take place outside using natural light. Uh, if, you know, folks are, uh, have to stay inside, then, you know, I wear a mask. Um, obviously, I will be vaccinated in a week, fully vaccinated as well. Uh, and, you know, there are other sort of precaution that, that you know, precautionary conversation uh, I have before any of my um, photo shoots. So uh, yes, I'm available. And if, you know, outdoors is an option, that's, you know, obviously the safest route. Uh, so, and yes, my website, you know, just send me an email and um, we'll have a consultation call and kind of figure out, what your, you know, what your specifics are for your family's legacy and how to capture them. Okay. Um, does anyone else have other questions? Um, want to run by possible questions of what you would want to ask your own family? I have so many unanswered questions that I would think of now uh, for my grandparents, you know, and my parents for that matter, they're all gone. So, yeah. um, and it's been occurring to me, my aunts and uncles are the next that I actually have to tackle that because um, it doesn't look like my cousins will. Oh, there's another question. Um, do you print your own photos and s send them out? I, prints are part of the package. I go through, um, uh, I, order through a lab that is, um, he does very high quality professional prints. And there are a whole bunch of different options for, you know, fine art or the black and white, um, full color canvas, uh, metal um, photos, which look really great on a wall and are pretty, pretty durable. So there's a lot of different options. So I don't personally print in-house. Um, I order through a website, but, um, this, this company has a lot of different options, so, yeah. Okay. Um, have you ever worked uh, with someone who's, uh, I'm trying to think how to, going through some sort of trauma in life, and so your family's been concerned they won't have them much longer, and how has that been? Yeah. Um, 
I haven't run across that. Or illness, I guess I could say, you know, something. Yeah. I haven't run across it too many times. Um, uh, Janet was diagnosed with a, a very rare brain injury or uh, brain disease. And that was, you know, part of, they felt again, that sense of urgency. Um, I wouldn't say it was um, uh, traumatic or there was, you know, fear, but there was that, that urgency was there. And there was, um, I experienced sort of a sense of relief that it was being done then while she was still, you know, with it. So, uh, you know, again, I sort of just um, work with, with uh, my clients to make sure that they, they feel, you know, safe and they're not uh, put on the spot and they don't feel pressure and uh, making sure that they know they can communicate with me at any time. And if things get hard or difficult, you know, I don't, I don't photograph those moments um, uh, mm. unless, you know, it's requested or something, but I, I haven't worked really with um, many people like on uh, deathbed. I think Walter right. is, is the, clo- yeah, has been the closest, but at that point we, you know, they didn't know when he would, when he would go. So. Okay. Um, we could always now just invite people to um, unmute if they have questions that rather just, you know, rather than typing it out that they could just ask. How's that? Sure, sounds good to me. Okay, are there additional questions people would like to just ask themselves rather than feeding them through the chat? If yes, just you could raise your hand and go ahead. Okay, Marie. Hi, um, this has been great informative this evening. Just a point when you talked about recording um, conversation. Uh, when our daughter was in Girl Scouts, one of the badges I believe she got was recording the past. And so she interviewed our neighbor's grandmother who grew up in Sheffield, not too far from here. And she remembered dirt roads, wagons, um, gas street, no street lights, then gas street lights. She remembered the paving of the road, first automobile that somebody owned down there. And it was all put on a little cassette tape, which um, Nanny's family still has, which is three or four generations now from there. And they were like, to have that and to have her voice on the tape you know, for, for the two generations that had no, who had never met her. So I, I, I think that's a, a great idea. I, I like that idea from there. So thank you very much. It was yeah. great. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. Um, that's my dad has cassette tapes too. And that's how he recorded his conversations. Um, and yeah, I just use my phone, my iPhone. Most of the time I do have a little, <laughs> you know, uh, digital recorder as well, but the phone is pretty discreet and you know once you get permission you can kind of put it down and and leave it there and it's not distracting or you know um, people don't get as self-conscious so that's what i tend to do now um but it's it's very fun to um you know find those older um you know recording methods and mm-hmm. i think important to bring them into this, this digital age to, you know, turn them into a digital file, because if uh, suddenly there are no cassette <laughs> players left, which oh, we're getting I, there. Yeah. Eight tracks from there, but yeah. And just, um, just one more thing, just last week um, in the local paper, they do a looking back type history thing. And there was an article about my grandfather and oh. that has kind of like started a ball rolling again with um, getting that partial article that was in the paper, getting the full article that the reporter got it from, and then kind of going from there and discovering two photographs of him, one in Washington, well, two actually in Washington, DC, and one with President uh, Grover Cleveland. They're standing side by side. So this has really been kind of like a, an interesting thing. And it's like, wow, here I go again, you know, another, another group of projects to start to have to do but thank you i I will let someone else speak thanks for sharing that and that's an exciting discovery for sure (laughs) yeah Oops, 
just realized I was muted. Uh, any other questions, anyone? Okay. Um, okay. Um, I had a question too, and it, I should have written it down, I suppose. And that's the problem. Um, so you, when you think of them, you just keep a running list of questions, I'm assuming, as well as what you send off. Do you go to your gathering with the family with additional questions beyond what you had sent ahead? Yeah, um, yeah it's that um, uh, part of it has, has been a continual uh, evolution because I have found that if I have these sort of, you know, um, pre-planned questions going in, some of them don't land. And so, you know, um, you have to either have backup ones and go on to those or redirect and, you know, in, in real time, you know, oh, wow, the, like they're really excited to talk about this thing. And then you just right. kind of, you know, go down that, um, down that lane. Uh, but, yeah, I've, I've had many discussions with many people, a lot of friends who have helped me um, sort of, uh, you know, again, this word distill, you know, distill down to like, what, what, what do people love talking about the most and how can we capture their, their essence? Um, mm -hmm. And there are some sort of universal questions and then there are really questions that are specific to certain people. So it's just constantly, you know, um, learning process. And um, it's, it's one part of my technique that I'm, that it is probably is changing the most because I, I find going in the questions that I originally had, um, you know, uh, there are always, you know, more interesting ones that come up and you just kind of keep collecting them and drawing on them, so. It occurs to me that uh, an interesting question for an elder would be, what question would you ask your elder who's no longer here? And then say, yeah. now would you answer that for me? That's a great one. Yeah, I like that yeah. one a lot. Like, what do you wish you knew right. about your grandfather or your, you know, and, you know, answer that for me now. Yeah. That's we also have a question. Um, what is your primary camera that you use for your photography? I have um, a um, 5D Mark II and a 5D Mark III Canon um, full frame. So two bodies and a portrait lens um, and sort of a mid range lens. And then I have a prime lens of 50 that I don't use that much. Um, so yeah, the portrait lens comes in handy because I can be pretty far away from the subject and um, it really kind of, uh, you know, the, the focus is, is really um, fun to work with. So that's for the, the um, other camera geeks, <laughs> that's my answer. But Canon, I shoot Canon. Um, I would imagine if anyone's like me and I, there's random boxes in my attic of cards or letters from loved ones. Um, I even have cards that a family friend sent every Christmas with a photograph from their family um, with a really humorous take on the year kind of, you know. And I, every now and then I find one of those boxes and think, oh, what's that? But that would be phenomenal in other people's families. Like I've collected these cards and here is your uh, mother's or grandmother's words, you know, sharing that, reaching out if you have that kind of thing that came from other families. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah, that's, yeah. And one thing that I do too with the books is I actually scan uh, family photos and, and, you know, or maps or, um, you know, photos of people or houses or whatever and, um, and include those in the photo essay book. So it's my, my photos that I take of them. And then there's these old, um, you know, family um, photos. And that's uh, really, again, to have it all kind of in one place, um, that's a really advantageous. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there are any other questions, now's the moment. Um, 
Otherwise, I'm pretty sure my dogs are about to go insane and deafen all of us. Um, does anyone have any final questions? No? Okay, well, we wanna thank you for joining us, um, all the participants, uh, and especially Augusta Rose for sharing um, her work. This is uh, inspiring. You know, I have, like I said, I know I, for me, have my work with my aunts and uncles to start. Yes, thank you, Augusta. And we have the link in the chat um, to um, Augusta's website, as well as the library links to the recording for um, tonight's event. And please uh, fill out the uh, post-event survey. We really do appreciate the feedback. We want to hear what everyone would like next. Okay. And our next event is actually, um, we have uh, work with someone on tarot cards coming up in May. So that should be fun. But Augusta, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. And it was great to have you here. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Have a great evening.